live. It's in the recording. Don't worry about it. I mean, Almost otherwise, it's just us talking. Well, welcome to Broken Shovel Homesteading for a Sustainable Future. Day of release for this episode is February 20th, 2024, and any and all information we have is current to that time. Uh, my name is Lucas, and I am joined as always by my friend and co host, Eric. Hello, Eric. It is chilly today. Uh, it is. Um, it is uh, uncomfortable out there when I went for our morning walk. Uh, I don't recommend going outside if you don't have to. <laughs> yes. What is it? Is it dry or humid out? Uh, I think it's pretty humid here anyway. That's, I'll check yeah, my weather station say, right like, now. It's, and, and humid cold is a, it, it just, it's not a fun cold. Yeah, I've got 86. I got 50, uh, 57 over here. Yeah, eighty-six percent humidity with uh, nineteen and a half degrees. Yeah, you throw uh, winds a wind in are... there, and that's bitter. That is yeah. bitter cold. And it's like, and it's not actually that cold because it's only in the twenties. But yeah, that that humidity and the little bit of wind just like oh, bites. It hurts. You. Yeah, it hurts your face. It you know. So we love living here, though. Yes, and we do. that is for a very very significant reason. The the summers. And the spring and the falls here are amazing uh, and really make it all worthwhile. We're going to talk a little bit about spring and summer today. Uh, We're going to talk about our gardens, uh, what we're sort of thinking about this year, uh, after we talk about these USDA zone, uh, growing hardiness zone changes. Um, And if you're not immediately familiar with it, just look up hardiness zone in your zip code and it will get you uh, to a spot where you can determine what plants you can or can't or rather should or shouldn't uh, uh, plant in yep. uh, uh, to grow. And this is also like if you look at the back of like seed packets you buy, the map is on there and it tells you like what zone that this plant can be well grown yeah. in. Because yes. you can grow just about anything anywhere. But it's just yes. how well it's going to do. For example, the peanuts that we tried to grow here last year, just out of yeah. curiosity. <laughs> yep. And maybe in another 10 years we can grow peanuts here, but not now. Yeah. Um, My sister tried, o- tried okra, and it just like it grew and it flowered, but it didn't really put off any fruit. <laughs> well, we're actually going to try okra this year uh, because we're doing some high tunnels for the peppers mm. uh, and, and stuff like that. So... Uh, we're going to give it a shot because, you know, a seed packet is what? Three bucks. So yeah, three, yeah. who cares? Yeah. Um, well, so uh, so for I've got some notes here. I'm just going to sort of uh, get us started here uh, for gardeners and farmers. Uh, there's a there's always been a familiarity, at least in recent generations uh, of the seasons. And the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, plant hardiness zone map, which is like a very trusted guide uh, for plant selection, went uh, uh, through a very significant update in 2023. um, And it's a nationwide shift in growing zones due to rising temperatures. So let's start with the why, why this happened. Uh, And I think it's, you know, I just said it, it's warmer. It's warmer, uh, and, but this is also a map that they, the USDA tries to update every 10, 15 years anyway. So this yes. was, it was time for an update. So this wasn't like a big, like, I think some of the zone changes were a big surprise, but the map coming out was not a big surprise. Yeah, no, no, it really wasn't. But, you know, the, the thing to point out here is that since the 1950s, the average annual minimum temperature in the uh, lower 48 uh, has increased by 3.3 degrees Fahrenheit, which is warmer winters and northward bound plants hardiness zones, uh, which is, you know, something Eric and I were sort of joking about before the show. Um, and, you know, we're going to be able to grow different things here. Um, but you know, before we start to zoom in on Vermont, I kind of want to talk about these hot spots that were affected by this. Uh, I don't know if you have any notes on that at all. Uh, I mean, where I, just have, bigger... I really pushed my notes on like just like uh, the like in the south zone. These uh, zones eight and nine moved more north. The the six and seven zone moved north. With the wheat belt, 
We went from a 4B to a 5A. Yep. And yeah, and 5B actually shrunk shrunk a lot looking at the whole overall map. The 5B region shrunk significantly across the entire country. So it just sort of moved. It just transferred and shrunk. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. It went a little more north and then got squished in between the 5A and 4B a little more. Okay. So, but the entire country is experiencing levels of change, right? Uh, certain regions have seen much more <laughs> than what we're seeing here. Uh, the Great Plains, the Midwest, and the Northeast are some of the most significant, um, yeah. with many areas jumping a full half zone or even a zone, a full zone warmer. Yeah, that's what I was, yeah, saying with like, yeah, eight, zone eight and nine for the south, which is yeah. very much your Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Florida, Georgia, into the Carolinas, like that whole stretch right there shifted entire, almost an entire zone. Yeah. Uh, but but interestingly enough, the West Coast uh, and the Pacific Northwest uh, really have had much less change, very subtle changes. Um, some areas just stayed exactly the same. Yep. So yeah, like Puerto Rico and Hawaii had very like little change to them. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, Oregon, Washington, Northern California, none of that really seemed to move. Which no, the Rocky Mountains, like from the Rockies into the Sierra Nevadas, like that whole region doesn't really, it kind of, I mean, it's a mountainous region. It's hard to get good measurements from there anyways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you're not going to see drastic change in elevation. I am still going to grow like it's 4A here. Uh, except for some, you know, things like the we we do a yearly experiment. Last year it was the peanuts, and don't try growing peanuts in Vermont. I can say that with confidence now. Um, but you know, this year we're going to try okra, and under certain circumstances, we're hoping maybe it'll work. Um, but yeah, unfamiliar territory for some of these people uh, in the Great Plains and the Midwest, which is a very important growing area. Um, you having to. Uh, adapt so rapidly uh or, you know in one year um i guess really they're not though this has been a warming trend it has been and the, the bigger problem i see is <laughs> is like what you sh thanks jeffrey um we just had a guest jump through the screen for those that aren't watching on youtube <laughs> uh, like i want to reference that the uh that article you shared with me yesterday and about the cheese yeah and how, I mean, in the article, they reference how, like, we don't have major biodiversity in our wheat crops. And that's a big problem when the zone, when we have zone changes like this, because we basically, we've, we've sent our, ourselves into on this one type of wheat. And it's like, wait, but this wheat doesn't grow as well when you adjust the temperatures a little bit. Oh, but we're so shoehorned into this one one strain yeah. that it becomes very difficult for farmers to shift to a different strain. Well, yeah, and I feel like we haven't said this out loud in a few weeks uh, here, but, but the, the biodiversity is so important. Uh, uh, the article I shared with Eric yesterday was about uh, cheese specifically Breeze. because yeah breeze and uh, I don't remember what other kinds of cheese but uh, basically the, so it's so the soft waxed cheese yeah that rely on a certain strain of um, uh, uh, basically mold uh, yeah, well, back, like, it goes back to like it was at the turn of the century they found they so prior to the turn of the century they had Tons of varieties of molds for making the different breed, breeds. Yeah. And then they found this just this one mold that was an albino white mold yep. that grew really fast that created this what called a light, fluffy cheese, which then like the entire French industry said, this is the standard. Like, screw all these other strains of mold. We want th this one. Yep. The problem is this one being an albino is it doesn't, it, it can only be... It can't self-pollinate. It can't reproduce. It can only be cloned. So yeah. over a hundred years, it has become degraded and is on the verge of dying out. But because they didn't use all those other mold strains that they used to use, all the other ones have died out as well. Yeah, and it's just this creating this universal 
flavor and texture so everybody is expecting this one thing which not only uh, i think makes cheeses less interesting it does uh, uh, but it also you know has cornered this this entire industry and now they're they're screwed oh camembert that was yes. the other cheese um, yep. And and this is the same thing we're seeing with wheat. Um, and uh, you know, I, I personally am more inclined to blame Monsanto. Uh, but uh, yes, this lack of biodiversity and now these drastic changes, and there's no infrastructure in place to to do that in an already struggling area for wheat. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 very very risky. Um, yeah. One of the other challenges is pest and disease. Like yep. these, these changes in the environment are going to bring new pests and new diseases. Yeah, uh, seeing, uh, ticks are a big, big one for us. Mm-hmm. Like because the war, it's warmer, the the ticks are surviving the winters, winters like they used to not be able to, and then they're steadily moving north. And like you hear, like even from everybody's story, like everybody who I know who hikes, you hear like on a like. Some of them were on a daily basis. It'd be like, yep, I found this many ticks on me today. Yeah. Yep, I found this many ticks on me today. Well, and I know some of the crew uh, for the company you work for, they come back with dozens oh, of dozens. ticks. Oh, yeah, dozens, exactly. They have, to, they, they, they have to thoroughly check themselves every day for them, and depending on where they're working, like, they also have, like, other spots where they work, and like, yeah, none. Yeah. Like, for some reason, like, I have, I, I don't have a lot of ticks on my hill. I don't know why. I I get a couple over the summer, but that's it. Like I mine have not increased a lot. Yeah, I I I do get a decent amount of ticks, but it's been consistent for for the time I've been here. Yeah. Um it's, you know, it's a big open field. A lot of deer come through, um and the cat is a hunter and he gets them on him and brings them inside. So it's, it's, it's a routine for Meg and I to, to check each other. Um, yeah. Oh, that's Every... that terrible. That, that's that <laughs> yes. It's the worst. My beautiful wife needing inspection. Uh, <laughs> that sounded so, <laughs> so sexist. <laughs> it's not, it's not, um, <laughs> So, moving on. Moving on. But but not only ticks, mosquitoes. Mosquitoes <laughs> yes, are moving mosquitoes. to higher elevations. Mosquitoes carry disease. Um, and uh, they, are, they are able to uh, expand where they are now. And that's that's dangerous. Very, yes, like very the, uh, dangerous. They're saying that over the, in the next five to ten years, we could see the Zika virus as far north as us. Yeah, which is uh, shocking. Uh, yes, no. it, it, it's currently very much only found been found in Georgia and Florida, but it's definitely like it's moving. <laughs> yeah, and that's this is why um, planting for insects is important. Like to not not like to attract them, but to deter them. There are plants that can be planted that deter insects at, at your home, um, and chemicals. Also, a healthy spider population. Like I, I will. Yes. I will huge advocate like i get these big like big quarter plus size orb weavers yeah. along my eaves and i don't bug them because like they have like their their silk is so strong yes and, yeah, they catch like everything i see them catching bumblebees which is hilarious yes um yeah and, and just planting you know things like marigolds and things like that and not spraying chemicals uh, mm-hmm. To add to the the potential problem of building up resistance, yep. um, bugs are not going to build up a resistance to flowers. They just yep, I, I uh, and herbs too. Like don't 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 discount the herbs. Oh, gotcha. I do. Yeah, cilantro, dill, basil, rosemary, uh, rosemary in between my tomato plants because also it makes your tomato plants delicious. <laughs> yes. yes, but it also it very much helps helps pests keep pests down is having like that's why i do every other plant is a tomato herb tomato herb tomato yeah. herb very cool yeah we do it with peppers with the tomatoes um so but yes this is this is scary and dangerous uh, uh potential moving of insects uh, to higher elevations and moving northward 
yeah. is uh, terrifying. Yeah, we let yeah. spiders just go f- go for it in our house. We really don't. Oh, I do too. My kids, the kids hate it. Oh, they'll get used to it. <laughs> but my problem is, is that I don't. I, I then in turn don't do, keep up on the on the cobwebs they leave behind. So I have these these dust filled blobs around. <laughs> Well, you know what might help with that? A broken shovel cobweb broom. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then, like, what I have for the third stress here, is, or, or challenge, is water stress. Uh, you know, so rising temperatures, reduced precipitation. We, we talk about this a lot on this yes. show. Yes, um, well, we just barely came out of a major, probably 10, 15 year... Uh, low water period this past year. Yeah, and even uh, still, like we could risk we risk falling back in if we get a poor season of water, we'll fall back into that again. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's you know, and I'm looking at you know getting pigs this year, and yeah. I'm 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 already sort of looking at ways to supplement the water that's necessary uh, for the pigs. Uh, and figure that out uh, essentially, and, and and thinking about placing them in places where there's natural wa- running water uh, and things like that, uh, it's uh, going to be important because that's a lot of water uh, for them, and I don't want to dig Thank another you. well. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, and some of these articles I, I looked at, and I'm sorry if I'm moving on from water here too soon. I know we talked a little bit uh, before the show about some trees. Um, yeah. Because uh, we get – so the article I saw about Vermont was that we have the uh, hickory something that produces seeds, which is the, the – like the bastard cousin of pecans. Right. But – and we are just barely in the region of, that can grow those before. <laughs> but now we're like, yeah, now these, these hickories are going to be able to – can survive more up here and like pecan growers – are going to start moving more north because they can start growing the pecan trees right. farther north. Yeah, and and you corrected me on this. I thought pecans took a lot of water. Some of them do, some of them don't. Like okay. they, because they're oh, also. I'm thinking of almonds. Yeah, almonds are a, are water. Yeah, because I mean, pecans grow in like they grow them in Texas and stuff, and it's okay. like. Oh, it's like borderline drought half the time there, and like pecans do great. Okay, like there's uh, a, a, a neighbor. A neighboring town to where my dad used to live was very big on their pecan groves. Okay. All right. Um, so, yeah. So, that's that's an interesting thing. And, and I hope maybe that, uh, you know, more divert – that will create more diversity here. Yeah. That would be great, uh, especially the hickory if it used to grow here and now it doesn't. Uh, that would be that would be great. Um, and alongside of that, I encourage everyone to buy American chestnut trees at any opportunity, even the hybrids. They are uh, they are nearly gone. Yep. So um, I like to brag about how many I have, and I currently don't remember the number, but it's a lot, and we're getting a lot more this year. Uh, and also growing them from seed this year, Ooh. which is going to be a really fun project. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about. Okay, so all these people, you know, a lot of these articles I, I came across, um, they were kept trying to say it was it was also expanding opportunities and extending growing seasons, and uh, um, it's going to cause it's going to bring about innovation in in the marketplace. It's going to have to bring about innovation. But yeah. do you see this as a positive at all? Not do you see? Her- for Vermont, where they basically in the article I saw, they're just basically like, "Yeah, we kind of changed zones, but you still have to follow the same rules." Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I... "Don't plant before Memorial Day," and everybody learned their lesson. Like, remember last year, everybody, yes. don't plant before Memorial Day. Yes, but... the, very, the famous Mother's Day frost. Um, so longer frost-free periods, though, is potential. Yes, uh, potential. Yeah, there's potential. F- I mean, I really saw like the article I saw it was very much a make, make more of effect on on what kind of perennials and, and the like you're going to get over what kind of annuals you're going to get. Yeah. So we we are hopeful, and we're going to try it this year, 
uh, some of our dye plants that we do for dyeing the fabrics, um, w their, their roots are what you use as opposed to the flower. And some of them, I, I, I sent you those photos of that yellow. Yes. That is supposed to be two years under of growth and to get like a really good yellow. That was one yeah. year that I sent you. <laughs> so we're hopeful that you know, we can actually bring these plants back to life the next year, that it's not as cold through the winter, which is how it is this year. But, um, you know, so, but our judgment, we'll get more into this in a minute, but is, is toward, um, see what it's like in three years. Yes. Um, so I'm going to talk, uh, let's talk about our zone and what we're growing this year and what we're planning for our gardens as far as expansion. Um, the, I, I guess the rest of this show is going to be what's happening on the homestead. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, so for me and my zip code in 2022, I was 4B and according to the USDA, I am now 5A. Yep. Um, these are general guidelines and, you know, microclimates exist. And, you know, Eric and I on any given day will, and you've said, you've told me before how many miles we are as the crow flies, but uh, we can yeah, have we're only like 15 miles. Like it's, yeah. it's not far. We're we not can far have far. completely different weather on this at the same time, uh, depending. Um, I often get a lot more sun than you. <laughs> so... yes, I guess I'm also on a northern facing slope. My and like my snow, I will have pot patches of snow like where my uh, in my hedges on the northern side of my house. I'll have snow into May. Yeah, yeah. I will get rid of my snow a lot quicker yeah. uh, up here. Although so... this year, not so much because our snow pack. I mean, we we haven't gotten much snow this year. No, we haven't gotten much rain either. Like it's it's kind of disconcerting. And like I, I mentioned it before about how quickly we could fall back into a drought. Uh, the amount of snow and rain we've gotten this winter is is concerning for our our chances of drought in the spring. Yeah, yeah, and for you know, for so many that rely on wells uh, to uh, not only uh, water themselves but water their plants uh, mm -hmm. and pr and crops, uh, it's it's very concerning. I think the dog is at the door. Uh, so I went through a few of my seed packets before. Uh, before we sat down today, oh, he's not at that door. Um, and I didn't really see a lot of change. You coming, Dusty? No, I'll leave it. I'll leave it cracked. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. The dog. Uh, the dog. <laughs> uh, I lost my train of thought. So, oh you, yeah, you, you pulled seeds. You're you're going through your seeds. Yeah. So you know. Um, Really, just looking at flowers here, like perennials, uh, the echinacea is the same, uh, daylilies are the same, columbines are the same, bee balm is the same, lavender, uh, and then annuals, zinnias, marigolds, impatiens, these are all things we already grow, cosmos and sunflowers. Um, the the only thing that I, I see as potential is basically extending the amount of time that we can grow these. Yes. Um, and then looking at vegetables, all the same, lettuces, kales, uh, all of the uh, brassicas of, of cabbage and broccoli and all of that stuff, peas, peppers, nothing is changed. Yeah, nothing's really changed. I'm like, I found an article about, that specifically said like some of the, some, some stuff that you could try this year now that we're in a oh cool what did you i am I'm, I'm looking for it now okay i, I, I of course ooh that maybe it was the wcax article so i think the a lot of uh you know our focus right now is really on uh farmers markets and you know growing things to make things uh you know we are uh oh don't make me do that. I was going to look at my tree order, but it's making me identify a bunch of crosswalks for Google. Uh, uh, yeah. But definitely trees. Trees is a big one for us this year, planting. That's usually the first thing we do. Um, I know I'm getting one sugar maple, several birch, 
um, and a bunch of oaks of different types, uh, a regular white oak, a swamp right up white oak and a red oak, uh, that I'm going to put in that back field, uh, to sort of try to take down a bunch of the, uh, pine trees that are growing back there and mm. encourage, uh, more useful trees, uh, you know, later down the line. Uh, so things with big canopies essentially, uh, uh, which will, uh, not only sort of break the 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 flow of wind through this property but uh encourage uh biodiversity underneath them uh as far as animals and smaller critters and things like that go um and then of course the sugar maple i bought the biggest one we could get from our favorite uh tree farm which is east hill tree farm if you're in vermont they are the best uh and they sell chestnuts um is uh, like yeah, a not finding the article. Oh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe nine or ten that. foot. I think it was an eight to ten foot sugar maple, which I'm really excited about. Uh, and you know, it's it's a slow growing tree, but it's gonna it's gonna just be a beautiful tree right off the bat. Uh, and uh, I'm really really excited about it. Uh, I'm also putting in some witch hazel uh, along the driveway, uh, sort of. Uh, you know, Eric, as you pull into my driveway on the left, right there yep. before that pine tree you helped me cut down, we're going to put two uh, witch hazels there uh, to Ooh. sort of break down on snowdrift over time. Um, they do have to they, they get really big, so it's going to take a while. Um, but you have to plant them like 12 to 15 feet apart. So it's a it's a bit of a pain, but um, it'll happen. And then the whole rest of the driveway going up that side is uh, lilacs. Uh, which I'm really excited about. Um, and no major changes in the garden. We're going to expand a little bit. Uh, we're hoping uh, to continue to expand, of course. We talk about this a lot. Uh, but the pig, I'm hoping the pig helps um, yes. to, to help clear land and just sort of move its paddock and get it to root and, and turn things over and, and uh, fertilize it as well, and then uh, well, that's, uh, me, you know I've I, I talked about it before. That's one of the things I'm doing with the chicken, the chicken poop this year. Yeah, yeah, you've been you've been hoarding it, right? I've been hoarding it. All right, two plants I finally found it that that are going to be doing that will potentially do better this year: uh, aster, bee balm, uh, beets, which already do pretty well. Here. Yeah, butternut squash already does well. Cat mint. Uh, chives, my chives already do really well. Uh, cone flowers, uh, coral bells, corosopus, geraniums, we already do well. Yeah. Hostas, hostas already do well. Hydrangeas already do well. Dephyllum, phlox, daylilies, Russian, Russian sage, rhubarb already does well. Yeah, I mean, some of it's new, some of it's, uh, stuff that we've already been able to grow. I'm sending it to you now. Yeah, so uh, I'm not hearing anything that is – I mean, everything on that list we grew here last year. Yeah. Uh, I really want to pull up my tree order. But um, so I'm not hearing yes, anything. I am really going to be experimenting a little bit this year with my garden because cause as you we all know, I had a horrible time with how much rain we got. My garden got saturated badly yeah uh so i'm going to be adding um well i have my, my my old sandbox which is about a 12 by 12 uh sandbox that had about six to eight inches of sand so it's it's a pretty good a bit of sand right uh i'm going to be using getting a uh a bobcat with a little bucket on it and i'm going to dig up the sandbox all the sand's going into the garden till it over two two times uh, the living beds from the chicken coop, that whole thing, like, and, and probably a little material underneath, because it's also a good good material, uh, that's going to go in, uh, till that up, and then a couple loads of local compost to really try, I, I want my garden up almost 12 inches. That's going to be a lot of work. Uh, yes. And that's why we're going to be pre-recording some episodes for spring. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, that's my big thing is like, because like, yeah, like I had a horrible time with water last year and, and things just not draining well because a number of years ago, um, the mint had gotten out of control and mint actually has about a six inch 
just root mass and my garden was so bad that I was literally taking out square like six inch square feet of mint root balls <sighs> and just pulling it out and so my, my entire level of my garden dropped and I still didn't beat the mint like the mint is still there yeah you're gonna have to start thinking about moving your garden I think at some point Eric like I will win no I will win <laughs> are you good are you planning any drainage Yes, I am planning some drainage. I mean, overall, if I just get the level of the garden up on its own, okay. it already has a natural slope to it, okay. and it will drain. I just have to get the overall, like, depth up above lo the lawn. Basically, I have to get it above lawn height again. Okay. Because it used to be above lawn height. But over the years, you're pulling stuff out, and it sinks a little bit, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And pulling out that much material, like, there's one corner that, like, it's, like, just this, this like, noticeable drop between the garden and the lawn. Now, and I know you and I have talked about you coming to harvest some trees uh, from my property, uh, but are you planning any other tree planting this year? Uh, Not too much right now because i really want to focus on getting my garden like more hardy again okay i mean well, yeah you know knowing you and and how things have sort of flowed for you over time you might want to consider getting some paper birch uh because mm -hmm. they do grow very fast and they are the <clears throat> soft they're the softest hardwood so yeah. uh you would you'd be able to get that amount of fire that you like uh right you know, out of one or two trees in a few, just a few years. Um, and they're just, they're great trees, uh, and easy to process, easy to split and saw and all of that stuff. So, you know, something to consider. Um, oh, there's my pen. Yeah. oh that's a text yeah. from you. Um, yeah. So we're, we're, we're expecting to expand, uh, primarily in our dye plants and our beans, uh, as far because we do so well with beans here, um, and uh, everything we have is heirloom, so we're just going to keep growing those beans and saving those beans and growing those beans. Um, yeah, like I'm doing, you know, I'm, I, I'm very, very, very like I keep talking about it. I'm really excited about it. it. Is my my what I'm doing? I'm basically doing sal a salsa garden for the most part. Right. Yes, and then maybe if you make enough, you'll you'll come sell at the farmers market. <laughs> yes, I have like cause be, I really think it'll do it, it'll be an interesting sell because it'll the the flavors will be slightly different because the tomatoes have slightly different flavors to them, and I'm curious about what the how the jalapenos are going to taste for the, come, uh, of a different color. Can we talk about our jalapenos for a minute? Yes, our. Uh, uh, we so Eric and I both ordered a, a newish variety of uh, of jalapeno called the Jedi yes. jalapeno, uh, and this plant is supposed to be more prolific and larger. Uh, which yes. uh, and and there's really no change to the flavor, uh, right? No, it's not. It has a very robust flavor, but not an overpowering flavor. Uh, it doesn't turn red. Right. I mean, it will. It will if you leave. It. I mean, any jalapeno, any, any jalapeno will start turning red if you leave it long enough. But it's very. It's a very green jalapeno, but it's a very uniform, four to six inches long. Uh, very, very good looking plant. I'm excited to grow this one among. Because I also have to. Like, I can't find the yellow or orange jalapenos except for Baker's Creek. Right, and. So, Baker's Creek, just real quick, let's address this. So, yeah. some years ago, they invited an extremely racist speaker to an event. Um, so several people got very upset. They canceled the speaker, um, but this stain has stayed with them. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of other sort of rumors about Baker's Creek, but, yep. you know, the only thing I could really find when looking into this is that they made a big mistake and like so many in the modern world that we live in now you're not you can't outrun it and yeah. that what they did is wrong um they corrected uh it's hard to say what their you know true reasoning was for for correcting that that error uh but it 
that is the major stain on Baker's Creek. Beyond that, well, it's it's there, rumors. Well, there's more. There, after reading into some of their controversy, there's more than just that. Okay. Uh, seeds that they said that they 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 sourced or organically and had like, had like paid people for. They found out they actually hadn't. They'd actually stolen the seeds. Uh, there are that purple galaxy that they said was non-GMO. Yeah, they lied. Right. Okay. All right. I did not like, read that. That one I expected. I'm like, bull crap. That's a non-GMO. They they hybrided the crap out of that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which I would have grown anyways. I don't care if it's a GMO crop because some of this, some strains that we to survive in the changing climates are going to have to be GMOs. Yeah. And GMO doesn't always mean laboratory. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Like taking a tomato plant, hacking it down from, to the stalk, and then splicing a different plant on top of it, then taking the flowers that come off of that and using the pollen on another plant – that is GMO. Yeah, and that's how we've gotten to a lot of the things. You know, this was being done. This has been done for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and if not thousands of years. And, yeah, I mean, they're finding like, I think like one of the cool things they found with the Baker's Creek is like one of the seat the beans I want to try this year is the, the like what is it the two the the fifteen thousand year old bean. Yeah, and you know we're. I didn't know about this, and that is bad business. Um, and it's important to know who you're doing business with, uh, yes. and and because if 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 like myself and Megan, it's part of our business. We have a responsibility, and we take it very seriously to tell the truth about what we're doing, where we get our products, and 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 how we grow them. Um, so, you know, we take that very seriously because we're not going to pay for a certificate. We uh, we count on our, our, our word and people taking us at our word. So as soon as you throw that away, it doesn't matter if you're telling the truth for the rest of your life. You're still a liar. Uh, and um, so <laughs> it's, it's important. And, and that is a major misstep by by Baker's Creek. And I'm glad I know it now because uh, it's yes. it's yeah, important no, I, to I, research. I think a lot of the Japanese growers said that, like, yeah, they stole our seed, our seeds. OK, yeah. And I, I, I was the, the ones I saw, it was specifically Japan. I wish I had the articles on hand. Cause I didn't. I actually didn't go into my Baker's Creek controversy this week when doing my research. No, and we had talked about it, but, um, you know, we are going to be ordering some things from Baker's Creek probably this week. Um, yep, same, same. And I, but I, I'm trying to buy more from Johnny's than I am. Yeah, Baker's. and Johnny's is where we got the, our, our, the, Jedi. uh, the Jedis, uh, which yep. I just couldn't be more excited about having a Jedi in the, in the, uh, in the garden. Yes, Jedi in the garden. It'll be great. It'll be very fun. And I think as we get closer to spring, we're going to be talking a lot more about our processes and what exactly we're doing. And, uh, you know, we want to hear from from you, too, if you are a first year gardener, if you've been doing it for 100 years, uh, how are you approaching it? Because I know a lot of people are looking at it economically and uh, as a supplement to uh, these outrageous prices at your yeah, everyday grocery I, store. If, if my salsas come out well, like I absolutely will go to the farmer's market with you and be at, have my little tiny table with like three or four jars and be like, yo, <laughs> uh, just put them on my table. Much, but it's a, it's a living. Just put them on my table. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm looking at it from that perspective and I had an idea. I had a thought and I lost that thought. I mean, yeah, I mean, oh, my, cause like, we're, oh, we're, with thinking of the lo of local growers is like, for some people, it's like some people are they're starting their seedlings in the next three to four weeks. Yeah, yeah. If not less, like end of February is a lot of people will start some of their early stuff, stuff now. Yeah, yeah, and and if you know, not only for self consumption but to sell, uh, mm -hmm. it's it's super important uh, for yeah, a lot I mean, of having a good good 12 13 18 inch tomato plant to be able to sell in april and may is key for some of these growers and yeah. having that like i like to start my stuff inside i had very limited success with the stuff i started inside uh but it did i, I did uh, i but also my garden overall didn't do well i think i had reasons for that but <laughs> yes i i like i'll be starting my stuff early again this year probably yeah i have uh not 
this upcoming week, but the following week I have days off, and I'm probably going to start a few things inside, like my tomatoes and my jalapenos. Yep, will definitely get started. Same, yeah. Uh, we're we're also doing a lot more direct sow this year. Um, uh, one thing I have been doing this year is somebody at my transfer station they buy the non recyclable five gallon water jugs uh, mm -hmm. for uh, for the like a water dispenser. And I've been taking those and I'm sawing off the tapered portion of the jug to protect plants in the garden should anything horrible happen again, <laughs> that I can just have yes. all of these clear buckets to put over yeah, plants. Yeah, also <laughs> it's great. For you, you, you mentioned wanting, you're going to be also, you're trying to stuff for your, hot, your peppers to get them hotter. And that's actually going to help those peppers get hotter because it's basically also a micro greenhouse. Yeah, yeah, and and the blue light it will will have a good effect as well. Um, so yeah, but yeah, so we when we do our seed starting, we we get a big we have a big rack, a big shelving like uh, industrial rack on casters, and we put it in front of that French door that we have in our our dining room. And on a nicer day, we'll open the French doors and put the rack right in the open, uh, you know, get fresh air, sunshine, the whole bit. Because most modern windows. Uh, filter out a lot of the good stuff that you need for your plants. Uh, so it's yeah. important to have lighting. Uh, if... That's why I usually do uh, mine in front of my, my, my southern facing windows that good good light. I'll put the plants in that window, but then also have a little LED strip yeah. over them as well. Yeah. And the days aren't quite long enough to, to, for what no. these seeds want, right? I think I looked at it's like 10 and a half hours right now is what we're getting. Yep. Um, maybe a little bit north of that. But, uh, you know, visible daylight, maybe an extra hour, but real daylight is is still in the t uh, less sub 11 hours. Um, yep. So. Yeah, I was like, I think it's this week. I noticed that it's at five o'clock. It's it's last week. Five o'clock was the sun was definitely like back behind the behind the hills and the tree line, but it was still light out. But then yeah. like. At the end of the week, I'm like, no, I got home at five o'clock and the sun is still like a little bit above the horizon. Yay. Yeah, it's uh, it's been nice. About 530, uh, you know, there's still I'm still looking out at, at the light and it's yeah. it's been oh. throwing me on the feeding time for the animals because I, mm. I, I get programmed by the light as well. And uh, I I keep forgetting to feed them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. So I was like, I, I I believe I've complained to you before of how like I've noticed some weird changes in the uh, night sky and where certain constellations seem to have yep. taken a weird shift this winter and the previous few winters. But um, I don't know what happened, but everything seems like it's back to normal. Like so, when I look out very due south from my house, uh, a little bit up is always been either Orion's belt or um, what does it sh shift to the scorpion in the winter? Right. Yeah. It's Orion's belt in the summer and the scorpion in the winter, but it like, it very much had like shifted towards the, the East or yeah. East at my house or West at my house. Well, last but now it's actually back <laughs> last night, almost due North was the big dipper. Yes. Um... Mine's, it, for me, it's a little, it, it it depends on what time at nine o'clock it's 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 kind of to the north east. east. Yeah, it was a little bit more eastward, but yeah, yeah definitely. But it's definitely there. Whereas like earlier in the winter, like in in October November, it was most it was prominently over in the northwestern side. Okay. And I took out my compass oh. to make sure I had everything correct. So <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I take pictures when it was over in the in the northwest because it, it was just weird. Because like I know the st the sky does shift at different times of the year, but it just felt like a very it felt like a more drastic shift than we've been seeing. And part of it, I believe, is is due to the po the polar our po what's our po the polar event that we have going on. Uh, which polar event is this? One of like the the, the actual the the, the, the magnetic north, oh. yeah the magnetic north moving yeah um, well and so okay well I think 
we should wrap this up. We're, I've got a lot we're of... The, we're, we're very off the rails. Yeah. So next week, what do we decide? Uh, mining. Uh, we're mining, going to talk yes. about mining uh, and, and the many implications of this, uh, which yes. we're not going to start talking about right now, Eric. <laughs> All right. So next Tuesday, tune in for mining. Oh, good. You're writing it down. Um, and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and uh we will uh we'll be back with that um as always if you want to find my business that uh my wife and i run uh just look up broken shovel 802 you will find us all over the internet in many different places uh we've been dyeing fabrics with uh, natural dyes this week uh and it's been really fun uh really Which exciting everyone i show the colors to they love it even the people that saw the yellow before you changed it oh. <laughs> uh, said they loved it like they everybody says they love the colors that you've been getting yeah we we brought some with us to the snowshoe a <laughs> yesterday here in Versher to show a friend and a couple other people were just like oh my god these are amazing colors and wait till you see these uh, Meg's been at the sewing machine the whole time uh, we've been in here uh, I'll send you more pictures you you can't dodge these pictures but we're going to have uh, table linens and aprons uh, coming up on our website uh, hopefully pretty soon hopefully in the next week yeah. or so uh, and, well, and, the, and I will say for our listeners like the colors are <laughs> The colors are gorgeous. Yeah, so the the plant I was talking about before, that yellow, that is weld. Yeah. And and that it was like this. It was like pencil yellow. It was it was yeah. I mean it was highlighter yellow. Yeah, it. yeah. It, it, it was high like you no, know, there's no pencil yellow. It was highlighter yellow. Well, and I I'll tell you this though, the you know, obviously it, I think the picture I sent you it was still wet. Uh, uh yeah, so it does sense. dull a little bit when like... it dries, yeah. Um, and then the, the really exciting uh, is the Versher Artisan and Farmers Market coming this spring uh, to Versher, Vermont. Uh, applications are going live at the end of the month. Uh, we just got our membership to uh, uh, several very important things, the Vermont Farmers Market Association, the Farmers Market Coalition, and the uh, Northeast Organic Farmers Association, uh, which brings all sorts of benefits for the market and for the folks uh, uh, attending. Uh, so, uh, so always looking for vendors for that, uh, right now, mostly meat and produce, surprisingly enough, we've, we've got some, right. we've got a lot of diversity to it, but I'd like to add, uh, add some lines to it. Uh, but yeah, May 19th, uh, the farmer's market starts Sunday afternoons, 1230 to three thirty. Uh, yes, I'm, I keep telling coworkers that, that I can, like, I'm like, you are going to this farmer's market. You are going to help, <laughs> yes. help support Lucas in his farmer's market. And, and the people that I've said that to are like, yes, yes, we're going to go to the farmer's market. <laughs> well, Which actually, ironically, like somebody was going to text you and come see you, but then realized it was 930 at night. Oh, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll guess who that was. Um, and... Yeah, that, I think that's it. We'll we'll talk about mining next week and a little bit more about our garden planning and and, and everything yes. we got going on. Um, but yeah, go team five B. <laughs>